the phone rang, and it was my parents. Hey, Frank, you coming home for Christmas this year? Oh, yeah. You got to come home. Your father already made the pina lada. And I made cannoli shells and anisette biscotti and reginelle cookies. My father's father owned a bakery on 222nd Street in the Bronx. My dad, who talked like a truck driver but was actually a CFO, grew up baking. It delighted him to make treats for the family, and this year he was pulling out all the stops. Hey, I got a recipe from Uncle Mario for those Amoretti cookies you like so much. You got to come home this year. It was tempting. But my parents weren't really inviting me, not the whole of me. They were only inviting the parts of me they approved of because I was not the son my parents expected. That was my older brother. He was a diehard Giants fan who made the dean's list at John Carroll University, a very good, very Catholic school. He married a cheerleader, had four kids, all of whom were so fucking cute I couldn't stand it. <laughs> and then he became a successful businessman. My parents half expected that a black sheep would come after such a frickin' goody-goody. Instead, they got me. And I was not the black sheep, oh no, darlings. I was the paisley sheep. <laughs> and John and Jeanette Di Palermo, two Italians from the Bronx, did not know how to deal with that at all. Homosexuals just aren't natural. Things do not fit, if you understand what I'm saying. How did they decide who's going to be the man and who's going to be the woman? <laughs> Only God is supposed to decide those things. Mom, Dad, you do realize you're talking about me, right? Has it ever occurred to you that you might have the demon of homosexuality? <laughs> if you ever wanted to try an exorcism, I know some people. You should consider it, son. If you got a demon, you want to expunge it. <laughs> so my parents wanted me to exercise my homosexuality, which is a lot like saying, Frank, we love you, but your right arm is disgusting. You want to saw it off? You can keep it in a cooler in the garage, and you can sew it back on later. But we don't want to see it, OK? No, not OK. It wasn't that I had to pretend I was straight. It was more that I had to pretend I wasn't queer. And watching them pretend was even worse. We had to tiptoe around so many subjects, who I was dating, who my friends were, how I spent my time politics, God and the universe, every meaningful thing. When I was around my parents, we played one fucked up and exhausting game of Twister. So for most of my early adult life, I stayed away, far away. But I still really love them. And sometimes I miss them so much, it was an actual ache in my chest that only got worse around the holidays. And I know they felt the same way. That's why dad baked all those Italian treats. He was trying to tempt me. And maybe he had an inkling that it was especially important for me to go home that Christmas. Maybe I did too, because I went. They'd long ago moved from the Bronx to the East Bay in Northern California, so I flew into Oakland Airport. They were waiting for me in baggage claim, dad in his striped cardigan and his little newsboy cap, mom in her maroon winter coat and floral scarf. Mom looked different. She'd lost weight and she was a little drawn, but she mentioned she was on a diet, so I chalked it up to that. Hey, we thought we'd take you to that seafood restaurant in Oakland you like, the one with the calamari dalmatino. Okay, let's go. But I'm not, I'm not ordering the calamari. I think I'm getting allergic. The last couple of times I ate it, it made me sick. Oh, you know, last week I got sick after eating calamari. 
The week before that, it was risotto with shrimp. Before that, it was your father's chicken cacciatore, but he always puts in too much prosciutto and pine nuts. It makes it so rich. <laughs> it was strange that mom could rattle off so many times she'd been sick. But don't people's stomachs get touchy as they age? And anyway, she was fine that day. When we got to the restaurant, she had the calamari dalmatino that I didn't order. Then she had shrimp scampi and then tiramisu for dessert. During the entire time I visited, mom ate like a true Italian, which is to say, passionately. <laughs> Crab cioppino on Christmas Eve, a ham on Christmas Day, all those desserts my father made. I came back to uh, San Diego the day after Christmas. On January 2nd, dad called. Mom was in the hospital. She couldn't keep anything down. Stomach cancer. I went back to the East Bay as soon as I could. The doctors suggested chemo, and the drugs they used were so nasty that they put my mother on massive doses of morphine for the first two days so that she'd sleep through the worst of it. And while she was under, they discovered that the cancer was much worse than they'd realized. And they decided the best thing to do was nothing. Since she couldn't eat, her death would come pretty quick. This course of action made sense to the docs. It made sense to my father. It made sense to my brother. It made sense to me. There was just one problem. No one told my mother. When I got to Alta Bates Hospital in Oakland, I found her propped up in the hospital bed wearing a blue turban to hide the baldness. She was bleary-eyed from the lack of food and the painkillers they were giving her. Confused, just so confused. The doctor came and listened to her stomach with a stethoscope, made a few notes and left. My father doted on her. He dabbed her parched lips with a moist Q-tip, put compresses on her forehead, but he said nothing about her condition. My brother sat on my mother's bed, held her hand, kissed her cheek, but he didn't talk about her cancer. At one point, there was a whole crowd of people in her hospital room, family, friends from the neighborhood, people she knew from church, everyone talking about this person's new grandchild, that person's new job, another person's gallbladder surgery, everything except the fact that my mother was going to die. Eventually, my brother went back to work, my dad went home for a shower and a nap, and her friends went back to their lives. That left me and Aunt Bernice to hang out with my mother. Mom dozed off, and Aunt Bernice says, your mother needs to know she's dying. <laughs> the poor woman, she's bewildered. I, I know, I know. I keep thinking dad, or maybe John, my brother, or the doctor, or the priest, one of those people will do it. Well, they're not, Frank. So it's up to us. And no sooner had those words left her mouth than my mother woke up, not surprisingly. <laughs> and she started to vomit. Between the chemo and the cancer, she did that a lot. My aunt held one of those kidney-shaped bowls under her chin, and I gently wiped her mouth with a washcloth when she was done. It wasn't so bad, and it was the worst thing in the entire world. Then my bleary-eyed mother turned to us. So? Am I dying? Aunt Bernice lunged at her. Oh, no, Jeanette, you're going to be fit as a fiddle in no time. Just you watch. And I wanted to lie, too. You're going to be fine, I wanted to say. You'll be going home soon. The house is full of flowers. I even wanted to say, I'll pretend to be your straight son. Instead, I put my hands on Aunt B's shoulder and I gently moved her out of the way. Yeah, Ma, you're dying. The cancer is worse than the doctors thought and there's nothing they can do. 
Nobody mentioned how much time you have left, but you're not eating. How long can it be? My mother nodded. No tears, no words, just nodding. Aunt Bernice said the Hail Mary. Sorry, Ma. She sighed and waved a hand. And then she looked out the window onto a prim little neighborhood in Oakland, California. Is that Westchester? Is that Aunt Yola's house? Westchester is a county in northern New York. Aunt Yola died 30 years earlier. Yeah, Ma. That's Westchester. That's Aunt Yola's house. Six weeks after my mother's funeral, something strange happened to me while I was sleeping. I'm tempted to call it a dream, but that's not really what I think it was. I, I think I somehow stepped into an alternate reality. I mean, it was kind of like a dream, but at the same time, it was realer than real. I was at my desk in my home office, writing on my computer, and everything was in its place the monitor, the keyboard, the mouse, the small basket filled with pens and pencils. But everything had this luster, like it was made out of blown glass. I mean, everything kind of vibrated with this weird molecular beauty. My office had been moved to a universe where the atoms were just more glorious than in this world. I was writing a poem. I typed. This night wants us, this night with blue eyes. But the words on the monitor were not what I had written. Instead, it read, hello, Frank. How are you? Ah, goosebumps everywhere. More words appeared while I watched. Frank, are you there? I typed, Mom, is that you? Nothing. I typed, J, 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 J. And on the monitor, I saw J, 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 J. I typed, now I lay me down to sleep. And on the monitor, I saw, now I lay me down to sleep. I typed, chock full of nuts is the heavenly coffee. <laughs> on the monitor, I saw, Yes, it's me. I miss you. My heart galloped. My scalp went prickly. I knew without question that I was talking to my dead mother. I typed, I miss you too. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just I'm so confused. Why? What's going on? Where am I, Frank? What's happening to me? My poor mother. Once again, she was confused. Once again, she didn't understand. Once again, the task of explaining things fell to me. Don't you remember, I typed? You died, Mom. You've been dead about six weeks. I suspected as much, but Frank, everything is so different. Nothing's like I expected. Ooh, that sucks. <laughs> Do you see anybody that you know? Oh, sure, tons of people, and I know all of them. My mother's right over there. Ooh, sorry to hear that. Her mother was a thoroughly unpleasant woman who suffered from perpetual constipation. <laughs> it's OK. She's different now. Oh, good. Why don't you pull grandma aside? Or maybe, maybe not grandma. Is your father there? Papa? Oh, yeah. He's talking to Uncle Vincenzo. Pull grandpa aside and ask him to explain what's going on. I bet he'll be happy to tell you everything, give you a little orientation. 
Good idea, Frank. I'll do that. Hey, Ma, can I ask you something? Of course. What, we're going to have secrets now? <laughs> Why me? Why aren't you talking to Dad right now? Why aren't you talking to my brother? She didn't respond. Maybe she thought the answer was obvious. Since I was the one with enough courage to tell her she was dying, of course I'd have enough courage to tell her she was dead. <laughs> and that courage does not exist in spite of what I am. It exists because of what I am. And maybe my mother now understands that that is a good and wonderful thing to be, a paisley sheep. for Frank DiPalermo.